this guy here. Okay, here comes Katie that I was what, trying to help. There you go. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to start our uh, Thursday night demo. Elaine, you want to get us started? Sure. Can everybody see my screen on the um, my screen with the three paintings? Now, Molden, perhaps you'd like to explain to them we were talking about the pinning. Yeah. So if you're um, wanting in Zoom to kind of see uh, Elaine and as well as her um, screen and her pin, her uh, iPad, if you are in speaker view rather than um, gallery view, then you can actually go there's a little when you hover over Elaine's uh, screen and picture there's a dot 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 if you click on that. You can pin her it's about the fourth um, little tab down and that'll pin her as a speaker, you can also do the same thing with her iPad which currently just has her picture on it uh and pin that so then you'll be able to see the screen that she's sharing plus both of her uh camera views and nobody else <laughs> okay well welcome everybody it's it's great to see you and um, we're going to take a look at a couple of paintings here tonight talk about the power of critiquing and What's even more powerful is how we can actually visualize some of the changes we might come up with, we might think of by working electronically. Now, I teach Procreate here at Oregon Society of Artists, and I'm going to use this tonight, but you will find that a few of the things that we talk about can be done right on your cell phone just by taking the saturation out and things, there's a lot you can do. So just want to um, verify that everybody can see the my screen. It's a little confusing for me that I see. You can see it, Molden? OK, we're all good. Okay, The first piece we're going to look at today, uh, yeah. <laughs> is a piece by Katie Sandy, and Katie's with us this evening, a friend of mine from over here in Washington. And she works in a, a lot in acrylic with collage. And she, I put this out there on Facebook and um, a couple of, in my class and a couple of groups and asked for people to suggest some things for us to critique. And Katie was the only one who came through for me. So thanks a lot, Katie. I appreciate it. <laughs> so I did call Katie the other morning and I said, Katie, what did you have a particular uh, Elaine, uh you're on mute. Are you able to unmute yourself? Okay. Perfect. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Okay, so Katie, here's Katie Sandy's piece, and it's acrylic and collage. And she said, no, she really did not have an aim. But the piece, the title of the piece is Mood Music. Now, one thing, whenever you want to take a serious look at your piece, critique a piece, is that you should look for the values. A great little quote I read recently, the values do the work, the color gets the credit. And when you think about that, it's really the values in a painting that tell the story. I think everybody here is old enough to remember black and white movies and TV. We still got the story without the color, but the color, well, everybody got color TV. It really was fun. And if you start talking, you overhear people talking in the gallery, nine times out of 10, people will comment on the color. Do they ever color, comment on the values? Not, not as often. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in, I'm going to take this piece and I'm going to go into um, an area where I can change the color. 
And I'm gonna take the saturation out of it completely, make it black and white. So we can really look at her values now without being confused by the color. And I'm really happy with these values. She's got darks, she's got lights, she's got mid-tones. I think she did a really great job in having these lights and darks a variety throughout the piece. So that definitely is working for her. Now, while I'm in there, we've, we've talked a little bit about the values. We could go in and we can monkey with the color and see just by changing the, the brightness, changing the, you know, the colors, how does this piece affect us differently when it's all blues and purples? How does it affect us differently with greens? And this is something that would really be helpful for you as artists. I think it would help if you could get in there and see the colors and monkey with those colors. And you might just come up with an idea for your next painting based on how those colors work or don't work. Now I'm gonna, as we work here tonight, I don't wanna do all the talking. I'm gonna ask you if everybody knows where the little chat button is on the bottom. Oh, I see there are some there. And I'm gonna ask Malden to review those as I'm speaking. And anytime you have a question or I ask a question, please type in there and we'll discuss some of your ideas on this piece. So does anybody have anything they'd like to say about the colors and the values in this? Malden, do you have anything on that? I don't see anything in the chat yet. Um, when you're chatting, if you chat to everyone, we should be able to see it. Okay. Yeah, no oh, questions. Okay. So the two far. that I see are just uh, the, okay. All just right, to you. Two. Now I see them down the side too. So that helps if I can see them. Okay, now, so again, Katie's, um, Katie's title here is Mood Music. So we definitely see the music notes. Um, and basically, I, I think to me, the way she put down the color, the shapes and the texture and the color, definitely to me says chaos. Look at that strong, strong orange. That to me, it's a color association for me for chaos. So I don't think she was going for anything soft and, and, you know, silky music. I think she was really going for something bold. She has the greens and the reds in there, but they are not as, the reds are not terribly intense. They are more, they are uh, darker. It's really the oranges that pop out. Oh, okay. Now, Lane, we have a question. Um... Someone, uh, Janice is asking uh, that, uh, ste stepping back, how did you scan? What app are you using to change the color and the value? Okay, as far as the changing values, I'm in Procreate. Um, and I, I totally recommend just taking pictures with your iPhone or your iPad. They have great cameras. Um, oh, and I just went and monkeyed with it there. Uh, the iPhones, the iPads have wonderful colors. A lot, most of your cell phones today have great uh, color. I'm a photographer. I'll tell you, I'm a professional photographer. And there's sometimes when I must admit my iPhone gets a little better color with things. So no worries about, I just took these, laid the painting down. Well, Katie sent me the, Katie sent me hers my pieces that we're going to talk about later. I just laid down on the desk and you can take the picture with your uh, iPad. Procreate will let you bring it right in. It'll let you take a picture in Procreate, but it'll also bring in anything from your, um, from your photos. So that's how I sent it in. And I'm going to get out of here because we already made a mess. And the other thing about digital is that you just, you have an undo button. So anytime 
you do something, even by accident like that, all you have to do is hit that undo button. So there's no need to be afraid that you're gonna mess something up. It's wonderful. Okay, um, here's a question. If you were going to add more color to this piece, what color would you suggest that Katie add? Anybody have any ideas they'd like to type in? What color? I'm going to give you a minute to think about it, and then I'm going to tell you what I think. Okay, we do have a question from uh, Janus again. Can Procreate change the you? It can. Um, I was playing with this. You can go to, um, it does not do it as well as Photoshop. Um, Photoshop Lightroom Camera Raw is meant for that. You can do a little bit with, with this, but it's really more meant for painting. Uh, if I go to the use saturation and brightness, I could go into the pencil and just change the brightness of one little area, like this yellow here. I'm, I can change just that, and it doesn't seem to be doing much. Well, it did it earlier. Hmm. All right, I think I need a different brush. Let me go try a different brush, a big brush that'll make more of a, um, a more distinct difference here. Okay, and I'm going for that little yellow square in the middle here. And you see, you can change just that one little area by going in with the pencil. But again, not with the precision of a, a really true photo editing program. Okay, now, to go back to my question, and I'm gonna get out of here and let me get out of here again. I, I, I thought a little bit about my question about, um, and we're, um, about the, what color I would add. Since we have reds and greens, which are complements, it seems to me that maybe we wanna throw in a little bit of complement of the orange, which would be a blue. And I can do that by just simply making a new layer. So this is like a blank layer on top. It's not going to affect what I already have. And I can try a couple different things. I can try something that would be more like a watercolor, keep the opacity down. And let's try sort of a turquoise. -y. What if she were to put like a, a turquoise watercolor over things? A few areas. Hmm. Okay, it certainly gives her something to think about. That's one thing. What if a true blue? What if we went for a much different blue? Like here, I'm picking my colors up on the top here. A really bold blue not so turquoisey. What if we did that? And what if we went in with, I'm gonna try a different brush. I'm gonna try um, something that looks more charcoal-y, something with a, um, some texture to it. What if we went in and really put in some bold blue? maybe near some of these oranges to really resonate off those oranges. Because remember the complementary colors will really make each other bold, look bolder and brighter and more saturated. 
So what do you think? Do you like the blue over it? Do you like both the, the, the blue and the turquoise? -y? Do you like just the turquoise? -y? Whoops, wait a minute. Had that layer hidden, so. Okay, just the turquoise. -y. Hmm. Elaine, we had a couple comments um, here. There's one was wondering um, what Katie was thinking about when she chose the colors. And the comment was that they were very jazzy colors, so maybe connected to music. And then okay. there was another suggestion of darkening the value and luminosity uh, in the upper left hand of the uh, upper left of the image to keep the eye on the image or in the image. Um, okay, here again, I asked Katie a few questions, whether I wanted, she wanted to identify uh, her, but I didn't ask if she wanted to speak and maybe I should have. So I don't know, we'll leave it up to Katie if she wants to uh, put in the chat line, if she feels like she wants to speak here, that's either way, Katie, whatever you want to do. But no, that's the other day, the other day in our phone conversation, we really didn't discuss why she chose those colors or such. And, you know, sometimes when we critique a painting, we really don't have all the information. Okay, Katie is willing to speak. So Malden, if you would put Katie on, maybe she'd like to speak to her colors. Let's see. Am I, on? am I on? I don't know. I'm unmuted here. Can you hear yes, me? you're on. Okay, didn't know. Uh, when I chose the colors, I definitely was thinking in terms of complementary colors. I do like to use those a lot because like you're saying, Elaine, I, I think, you know, they play off of each other and do that. Um, I just wanted to do something with music and, uh, you know, I didn't have any color significant as far as mood goes and things, but I always, I paint very intuitively, uh, just looking at uh, shapes and colors and and value too. And I, I was going for the value in it. And I told Elaine, I'm not so sure it's quite finished yet anyhow, but, um, um, you know, the, the music, the cream color or light almost of the music gave us start value to start with. And that's why I put the darks in. But uh, anyway, I hope that answers people's questions. I really didn't other than to, uh, kind of colors I like and to colors, uh, the complementary colors. As far as what you were doing, Elaine, while I'm on here, I, I kind of liked the turquoise with it. I did not like the blue with it. But, and that's uh, exactly how I felt, Katie. I was playing around with this this afternoon, trying to get some ideas and definitely, uh, definitely like the turquoise. But we just don't know till we try. Right. And, you know, I tell this story so many times when I do this sort of thing. Many years ago, I took watercolor classes in Rich. Ridgewood, uh, New Jersey, and you were just feeling good about a painting. And the instructor would come over and he would make suggestions and you literally froze because for me, he'd say add a figure and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is watercolor. What if, you know, what if my figure doesn't come out right? It's hard to scrub out or maybe you just couldn't visualize when he said, pump up those oranges. And you're like, ah, I don't yeah. know how that's going to look. Now you know, Katie. <laughs> oh, now you know. Um, you can try these things out. And even on the iPad, her original piece is there. And she can turn it on. She can turn it off. She can try things. Um. Oh, and somebody asked how large the original piece is, Katie, and I have no idea. Say that again, I didn't. Know. How large is the original piece? Oh, the original piece is about, it's on canvas too. It's not on paper. It's on canvas, so the gallery wrap canvas. And I think it's a 16 by 16, it's a square. And you see, when we really zoom in, we can see some of the texture of the canvas, some of that raw canvas right. texture. And that's what I was talking about the other day on the phone, Katie, when I was talking about the dots. Yeah. Is some real texture. And here again, we can zoom in 
when you have a photo of your work, even if it's just on your cell phone, you can zoom in and really, really look at just little sections. Now, another thing that I thought, I like it just the way it is and it's on canvas. So Katie really isn't in a position to be able to crop it. But let's just take a look anyway. If we go to our canvas and we start playing with it, you might find a piece that works better, you know, a little cropped. I don't, I don't find anything I like any better here. I think her composition, her values works. But again, this is something we can do digitally. Sometimes that I may not be able can, to do. You can rotate it too, and sometimes look at it as an abstract. I mean, upside down or a different direction too. It sometimes makes a difference in some of these. And of course, that's something you can do right on your your easel. But right. with in Procreate, it's two fingers. Just you know, try it different ways. Zoom in, zoom out, and you should be able to do that just with your phones. Uh, zooming in, zooming out, rotating things. And I really think that's a big help while you paint to see it side by side. Okay, well, thank you again, Kay Katie, for um, helping us out with this. I'd like to move on to something a little more. How are we doing on time? Um, I'd like to move on to something a little more representational. And this is something that I found in my pile. Uh, I started out as a watercolor painter and I painted in, um, exclusively in watercolor for so many years, but lately I just, oh, I don't know. I say, there's the original painting. I, I'm just, nine times out of 10, I'm not thrilled. I say, okay, that's boring. Oh, well, I don't know. I just am not happy. And the worst thing you can do, and I know we all do it, is just throw it in a closet someplace. Don't do that. Get it out, get it, get some friends or, you know, bring it to one of your art classes, get a critique. OSA has a critique group, which never seems to get a lot of people, not a lot of registrations. So get it out there and see what people think. I know what I feel is um, really wrong here, but I'm gonna give you a minute to put in the chat line if you think, what do you think is wrong with the, um, with the, 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 well, I shouldn't say the drawing, but what is wrong here in the way it's, um, I have two things that I'm concerned about. So does anybody have anything that they'd like to say that's correct, a correction in my rendering? What do you think? Anybody? So far, no comments yet. Hmm. I'm gonna have to tell you what I think. Well, maybe I'll tell you. Oh. Okay, Michael says the water fall is a bit too white okay and what if the areas around the stream were darkened okay that that's that's a good one now i paint a lot of rocks and what's bothering me here is to me these rocks and it's a common problem people start painting rocks they look like a bunch of potatoes piled up so i'm going to I made a, a duplicate copy here. Wait a minute, let me get rid of this one. I'm gonna make a new duplicate. And I'm gonna just paint on a layer ahead of, of, above it. And I'm going to get some browns, some grayish browns going on. And I'm gonna get rid of some of these rocks and just make it one bigger rock. So, all right, I'll work in a pastel. Oops. And I'm gonna try to get rid of some of these and I'll get some warmer tones in there, but getting it to be more of a, um, you know, one big rock rather than just all these rocks piled up. Where am I? I'm gonna, another crazy brush here someplace. All right, I wanna go back to my pencil. 
And when it pops up like that, it's it's asking me if I want to make adjustments to the brush, which is an, another whole bowl of wax. Okay, so we have some. So I'm trying to make this less looking like piled up rocks. All right, who who thinks that's any kind of an improvement at this point to get rid of some of those horizontals? Okay, John Slocum, good job, John. Nice to see you again. I haven't. John is a pro creator. Okay, and somebody mentioned darkening the uh, areas on either side of the stream. All right, let's, and you know, if I, you can't see it, but if I put my finger on this little square button to the left, it will actually suck up a color. And I'm gonna go for one of these. You see how that circle comes up? It's, it's sucking up the color, it's sampling it. So what if I, Started painting over here on both sides. Well, it might be a little bit dark. And I'm still, I'm in my pencil. Let's go to a piece of chalk. Okay, yeah, there we go. Let's see what that looks like. And maybe some darker rocks over here. Now, if any of you do watercolor, you can imagine that scrubbing a watercolor and painting over a watercolor, it's not easy to change. If you do it in acrylics or oils and you don't like it, you're, you know, you're gonna be uh, dissatisfied and feel bad that you can't get back. But with watercolors, sometimes it's really hard to, to paint over something and let, make it look uh, convincing. So this is, this is a big help here. Okay, I'm gonna get some of those horizontal lines out of the left side here too. Bring in a little bit cooler, cooler shadows. Okay, now back to Michael said that he thought the watercolor was a little white. Well, I've always been a little concerned about the diagonal in that water fall. I don't think water would fall that way. So I'm gonna go in with, oh, I want something very solid here. So I'm gonna pull up an acrylic paintbrush and I'm gonna try to really step these down. So I'm gonna try to go down and down so it's cascading off of the uh, off of uh, rocks, but not. In fact, we might get rid of some of this stuff right here. Okay, so it's coming more straight down. I want it to come more straight down, and I can go in with some white. And in fact, we've got some great brushes which are a splatter. And I love the splatter brushes. You know, if you try splattering in uh, watercolor, it just gets all over where you really don't even want it. But here you have, it splatters, but you have great control over it. Look at that, if that doesn't look like water falling. And maybe we make some of that splatter more blue. And we've got the smudge tool. So maybe we want to smudge that in. And that again is getting rid of some of the too much whiteness that Michael was talking about. Okay, here's where, here we go. Here's what I've changed. I'm going to try to pull this down so you can see it better. Here are my changes painted right over. And here's back to the original. The changes, the original. Do you think we've made improvements? John isn't sure. Is that a not sure, John? <laughs> what do you think? No, no, Jan Janus doesn't like it either. Okay, we do have a comment here about the green background. 
John says the green background should be lighter. Hmm. Okay, we can try it. We can try making it lighter. I'm gonna get another layer going and I'm gonna come up with a lighter green. Now we can do this both ways. I, my first instinct was to make the, um, the background darker, but we're gonna try it both ways and see what people think. Um, and of course, with the light trees, the dark was good, but let's, let's try it. Let's bring in some lighter greens and more yellow greens, maybe a little less yellow. These may look, too, oh, that looks too fake. I don't like that. So I'm gonna hit the undo button. All right, I'm gonna bring it back to a little more um, yellow. Uh, to me, this has always been my feeling painting is the greens in nature are yellower than we think. Paint tends to be more, always looks a little fake. You really have to mix your greens with a little more yellow than you think. That's been my experience. Okay, John, what do you think? Lighter? Does everybody like lighter? Katie does not. Nope. No, Janus does not like lighter. No, cut it. Okay, well, we're going to cut it. Um, we're going to just uh, delete that. And now we're going to go back with what I was thinking of doing, which was going a little darker and bluer behind these trees, even more so because I really want those trees to pop out. And maybe that means that we have to paint a little, you know, few evergreen branches popping out. Now I'm not gonna, you know, delineate the whole darn tree because we want it to be soft back there. We don't want it to pop too much. Um, I'm gonna stick to a watercolor. I'm gonna go back to my, some watercolor brushes. Ah, wet sponge. Let's see what wet sponge dark would do. Oh yeah. And again, this is bluer, but we can go to more yellows too. Yeah, that's too yellow. We could throw some yellows in. And I don't know what I want to do with that evergreen tree I started. It's yeah, maybe make it a little less popping out. I don't like that. This is my size of my brush here. Okay, what do we think about that darker? What do you think about a little, a few more of those lighter trees back there? Um, We'll go back to our uh, charcoals for that. Elaine, we had another question. Um, oh, okay, yes. Janice is asking, what is the subject? What is the feeling we're trying for? Well, I really love waterfalls. I love to go out and photograph them and um, just sit by them. And I think the draw for me is that every time you go, it's different. It's just like the ocean. The water is flowing differently. And so I can go to my same favorite waterfall spots and it's always different. So I'm going after that, you know, that action of the, the water and the splash. And I don't know, there's just something, there's just something about getting uh, uh, back to nature and the power the power in, the, in a waterfall. And whether you believe the power is coming from nature or uh, personally, I like to feel that we have, you know, God has created some of these things in nature that it's just amazing the power behind the uh, waterfall, the ocean. It's, it's just amazing to sit there and watch the power. So that's what I was going for. Um, as for, but you know, we have not yet looked at the values in this piece. So 
I do have to flatten a certain amount in order to look at the values. Now let's look at my original values. And um, <laughs> okay, there's my original values. And I feel like it needs more darks. Could I see a show of bobbleheads? Who thinks we need more darks? Okay. So now if we go back, we undo that. Huh, what's that bright? Okay. And we bring in my darks, my changes. And I'm going to keep the, the original back there hidden. So we're going to have to flatten this down. And unfortunately, that's what we have to do to get them all. Okay, let's look at the, what do you think? I think it's a little better. I think I, those darks I put in did help. Definitely helped. Now, before we'll, I want to leave some time for questions, but I want to leave you with this thought. And this is something for everybody has to ponder. If this, if the changes we discuss in a critique can't be done in the medium, whether it's because it's, you know, calls for cropping it or, you know, painting over it, and we just can't get it. And now we have it digitally. And we could call, in my eye, and I've done this many times, I now call this just a mixed media, watercolor and digital. I don't see a problem with it. They're just two different mediums, just as some people would say, if you have a failed watercolor, just go at it with pastels and do something. I mean, there's no sense of it trashing it. Do something to save it, to improve upon it. You'll learn in the experience and you might just come out with a painting that you want to uh, frame and show. But th that's the question. How, how valid do you feel it is to make these, to combine? I see no problem with combining digital and um, traditional media. Okay, it looks like we've got some questions, Molden, and I'll let, leave that to you. To... Yeah, the first one that came through was a suggestion of more darks in the foreground from Katie. Yeah, yeah, we definitely, I'm going to have to get out of here and go back and I have all my, yeah, we definitely could bring in more darks. I was going for a sandy, um, you know, a sandy look, but maybe we want to bring in some really dark greens. Maybe that's something to play with if you, you know, um, darks in here in a different color. Maybe. That again would help bring some of the values, some of the darks to other parts of the painting. So that might be a very good suggestion, Katie. Okay, what else do we have? Uh, there was a question about the file size. Um, how large can the final print be be made? And then how, how large is kind of the file size once you're done? Okay, well, the, how, how large of a file size depends on the iPad you're working on. This is last year's model, the iPad Pro, the last one before they came out with the new M1 chip. This, that one is supposed to give us even more. And it also, um, it also ha has to take into consideration how many layers you work on. If you have a older iPad, you may be limited in the number of layers you uh, can use. So that all takes into consideration. Here, when I go to my canvas info, I get the pixel dimensions and I get the size. Now, that was taking the picture with the iPad. I had to do a little cropping and make it work. And my 
for some reason, it, it popped up as 264 DPI. Now, when I go to print, I like to try to print a 300 DPI. That's where you're going to get, you know, good um, print quality. This is close. So unless it's a piece with a lot of detail in it, you can probably print in the two to 300 range. Um, upsizing in general purposes, upsizing digital files is not a good idea. It will get pixelated. There are programs out there that say they can do it. The newest Photoshop is really pretty darn good at doing it. So if I wanted a larger file size, I could probably then take it to Photoshop. But I like how Procreate gives you all this information right here. And you can, you know, you see your pixel dimensions, you see your inches, the thing that we, we understand and how we're gonna to go to print. Does that answer the question? I think so. Yes. Okay, great. There was another question um, about comparing uh, what you're doing now with the real with real paint real world kind of the so comparing the brush with the digital brush and a real brush and maybe what the difference is there well i'll tell you now that i paint so much in this sometimes i feel i have more control um i'm painting with the apple pencil and it really feels good in the hand and it really puts down color um just right. Uh, there are lesser styluses, especially the old, remember the old fashioned one with the rubber ball? I couldn't, I could not draw with those for, for love of money. In fact, the first time I picked up an iPad, I it was, it was a borrowed iPad. I took away with me on a weekend to try painting and I took it right back to my friend and I said, nope. In those days, I was using a Wacom tablet and I was used to that. But to tell you the truth now, this is wonderful. It's direct to the canvas. And this is so easy to take with me anywhere I go. And I can sit in my recliner with my feet up and I can be painting away. It can be sitting in my car or, you know, any on a plane, I can be sitting anywhere. I still like the feel of my paintbrushes. I would never give up my paintbrushes. And there is something about putting down color and it runs a little bit. And um, there's still something to that. And that's why I always say, this is not trying to do away with paint. Windsor and Newton, Holbein, they have nothing to worry about because there's always going to be a place for traditional, but there is something, and it takes a little bit of getting used to. It takes a little getting used to painting this way, but this, there's a lot of advantages as far, I find myself now when I paint watercolors, I'm like, oh, I wish I could make a new layer. I wish I could put my other color on a new layer. Of course, we know we can glaze watercolor, but it's not that easy to take out. I want my undo button. So there's, you know, there's pros and cons and it's just, um, you know, what you do. Okay, I see the question about printing. Uh, I must say that years ago, I had a pretty good printer and I tried printing myself. I haven't in years uh, because I just find those home printers are too um, unpredictable. I find them skipping, uh, colors aren't quite right. Right now, I'm using a uh, commercial printer here in Vancouver by the name of J2 that does the G Clay. Now, G Clay is nothing different than your inkjet. It's just a fancy, the, the individual little squirts of ink are much smaller and they're dealing with more colors and more precision, but it's basically an inkjet print. 
And they can print in any size and they can print it on any paper. You have a choice of papers, which if you try printing at home and uh, you could jam up your printer with the wrong paper and get yourself in all kinds of trouble. So um, Dick Blick does G clay printing. Uh, I, I, I understand there's another one in the Pearl, which I think is very spendy. One of my students has had some, you know, really big pieces printed um, up in the Pearl somewhere. But um, it's really not worth the aggravation trying to do it yourself. Elaine, uh, I had a question uh, for that watercolor that you're working with. Would you use this as a tool to maybe go back to the original and then try and work in watercolor again? with trying to correct the things that you might have wanted to? Absolutely. I would take a toothbrush and start scrubbing. And um, I, I will probably do that coming up maybe this weekend. I'll probably go in there with a toothbrush and start scrubbing at those that pile of potatoes. And, um, you know, maybe trying to work the waterfall. And that's another whole piece of this. Um, with some mediums, it might not be as easy to fix. A couple of weeks ago, I had a very, very enlightening moment. I feel like the weight was off my shoulders. When I went to school for watercolor, you did not dare use white and you did not dare do certain things. It was very, they were very, very purist about it all. And it took me years to open up the little jar, the little tube of Chinese white, because that was like a big no-no in college. Oh my goodness. Whew. But I was talking to um, Jeffrey Hull from Cannon Beach. I was in his gallery. I knew that was him. And I struck up a conversation. I asked him if he ever teaches. And he said, every day, what do you want to know? And he took me out into the originals and he started talking about taking a toothbrush to it. And he says, I don't care. Maybe you might rip the paper, but just take a toothbrush to it. And white paint, go ahead, use, a, use some uh, gouache, get some white paint on there. Don't be afraid to do whatever you have to do. And I thought, oh, all these years I was, you know, I thought I had to be a purist. I finally let loose. So maybe you have to paint over it in, uh, you know, pastel, pastel paint, uh, uh, pencil. Maybe you go, maybe with oils, you can get in there and paint over it. But if not, you always have it on inappropriate. Okay, anybody else have any other questions? Okay, here's a good one. Can you suggest a few good recognized artists using Procreate? Um, there's a fellow by the name of David Hockney who works in Procreate. And I have another one in mind that I'm totally drawing a blank on. But if you, YouTube, get on YouTube and search for Procreate, I do have to warn you about this though. There are a lot of artists today doing Procreate that it's very cartoony and they're doing a lot of cutesy little and it's very hard for me because I follow the Facebook pages and the YouTubes just to see what other people are doing. And it's very hard for me to see all these cute little cartoony things because it's not my thing. I teach a painterly approach to pro uh, procreate and I try to do it painterly. And there are others out there. Uh, James Julia is a British artist who does, and he his line of work is in um, video game backgrounds and sci-fi type of things that way. But he has some um, YouTube, um, tutorials on there that are quite painterly. I was in a uh, demo this summer where uh, a, a, 
uh, he did a demo and he did a class. And he is, he, his uh, tutorials online are quite interesting. So there, yes, there are, they are out there, but be, just beware because you are gonna find people that make cute little pandas. Hmm. Elaine, would you be able to spell uh, those two names? So people can oh, sure. Them up? Um, let me see, I'm gonna put it in the chat line here. And I wish I could think of the, the, the last, that other one that I have followed a bit on YouTube. But certainly those two are a good start. Nice. There was also a question um, about Procreate. What are the advantages of using Procreate versus another app? Well, it's, I think like everything else, it's all what you try a couple different ones and see what you like. I was a huge fan of ArtRage. ArtRage was, you know, that was it on the computer. But ArtRage on the iPad was very limited. They have upgraded it. I was so excited when they upgraded it. And I still, I don't know. Some of them are a little more like natural paint. Uh, ArtRage has a palette knife. There are some of them, uh, there's one Adobe product that, a fresco that actually has paint that runs, watercolor will run very un, uh, you know, you can't predict where it's gonna run to kind of like on real watercolor paper. That I think Adobe shot themselves in the foot with because it's a monthly, it's a monthly subscription like they've done with their uh, professional grade stuff on the computer. And I don't know why, because most of your iPad software is so cheap. Procreate is $10 and you have unlimited updates for life. Another one, which is really kind of nice to try for free is Autodesk's sketchbook. It's free and it has some great features in it. And as I say, Art Rage is another one. Art Rage will give you the feeling of wet oil paint. And you can, you get in there and you mix it and you smear it around with a palette knife and the colors will mix and run into each other just like thick oil paint. So it's just basically, the fun thing is that because these programs, so many of these are so affordable, most of them are under $20, you can, you can just try a few and see what you like best. But of course we do procreate on Wednesday nights at OSA. So we'd love to see everybody like procreate. But procreate is only for the iPad. Another thing with this, uh, the sketchbook can be done on um, Android tablets. And that's something that I was, it's still in the back of my mind to do is to uh, come up with something so that folks from OSA who have Android tablets aren't ready to make the, um, the leap to iPad would try maybe either ArtRage or um, Sketchbook on the um, Android. I don't know. I don't have an Android tablet. I've been trying to get a hold of one. Um, since they're not as powerful as iPads in general, I don't know how. Um, I'm thinking there would be some lag time, but I don't know. I don't know. It's just to, something to try. Well, thank you, Elaine, for sharing all of this with us. Uh, do we have any final questions from anybody? No, it doesn't. No, look like well, it. then I'm going to thank everybody for coming out. It's really nice to see you, even the folks that um, we don't see. We didn't aren't on video tonight, but um, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for coming out. And uh, 
hopefully we'll see you again at some of these other Thursday night demos. Yeah, thank you very much. And we're looking forward to your class uh, in winter term. Uh, so it'll be online. Yeah. If anybody is interested, you can take it, take it from your home. And it's a drop in class. So if you ever feel like you don't want to sign up for the whole thing, every class is very individual. It has each class has its own project. Hmm. Adults, we have very busy lives and sometimes we can't commit to a, a you know, a, a 10 or 14 weekend class. So anybody, please feel free to register and drop in if you just have a whim to try it. Nice. So, okay, unless there's any other questions, I guess we could sign off for tonight. Looks like great. Right. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for coming, everybody. And Elaine, thanks for demonstrating. It's well, lovely. thanks for your help, Walden. I You're welcome. Good My to first see time trying. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody.